to introduce the uh, second session speaker. And if Dr. Saeed, if you don't mind, I think the second talk is going to be acute heart failure. And we have a very challenging case with someone with uh, severe LVSD and AKI. And I think- So I can't leave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so your message is going to be very valid. Okay, Dr. Ahmed, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Azib. I think you've given the game away there, but we tried to keep it a surprise. But, uh, so, um, I'm really excited to uh, begin this uh, and introduce this uh, session. It's uh, more of an interactive session. Um, it will begin with Professor Shahid Junejo, who is a consultant uh, cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, who has a very special interest in heart failure and developing heart failure services. Um, and he will begin by giving us a, a talk uh, then we will have a, a case presentation, in fact, two cases by, presented by Dr. Hinder Zain, who is a uh, cardiology registrar in training, um, rotating in the Northeast uh, Deanery. We, uh, we hope that Dr. Saeed Ahmed will also uh, stay with us and provide input, uh, particularly regarding renal issues. Um, we have Dr. Mohammed Badri, who is a consultant cardiologist working at uh, Umdurman Heart Center in the Sudan. He's an interventional cardiologist. Uh, we have Dr. Mohammed Abul Saud, who is a, a, a cardiologist, and he's a, a currently working as a senior cardiology fellow in, in Advanced Echo, also he, at Withenshaw Hospital. He's also had experience working as a transplant fellow in Withenshaw, so that'd be very, very excited to have you uh, on board. Um, we also have Dr. Yaqub uh, Musa, who is a consultant cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, um, working at uh, a Shab Hospital in Sudan. And we also have Dr. Nasir Al Qasim, who is a consultant cardiologist working in um, uh, uh, Ahmed Qasim Hospital in Sudan. So thank you ev to everybody. Uh, and I would like to begin uh, by passing over to Professor Junejo uh, for his uh, talk. Thank you very much. Right. Um, thank you very much. You give me a couple of seconds to try and uh, load my talk on uh, and uh, share the screen with you. I'm very grateful for the introduction. Um, uh, and I would like to um, just um, just let me see if I can put this on uh, and you guys should have the uh, happy enough with the screen. You can see where, where I am. Perfect. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm just going to try and see if I can work my way through this. Um, uh, right. Uh, okay. So uh, first things first, can I just say, uh, I am I mean, very grateful for the invitation. Um, Eid Mubarak to everyone. Uh, and I think I commend um, uh, Dr. Abdulazim's intentions of trying to get knowledge spread in the, in the world and time where we are all isolating and not able to meet. So this is a fantastic forum on which we can share our um, knowledge, experience, and, and our thoughts and learn from each other. So thank you for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and Dr. Adlan, thank you for the in, invitation as well. Can I just um, uh, point out a, a, a slight correction? I am also an interventional cardiologist. I have an interest in heart failure, uh, but the services in our institution are led by Sam McClure and Martin Farrer in terms of the um, development of heart failure um, and uh, sort of services as such. But I have a contribution to that and an interest in uh, a, particularly in acute heart failure in the context of coronary disease to start off with. Um, so uh, those are my uh, sort of positions. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, these slides are my own as such, um, and I've tried to keep it uh, less uh, intense in the sense that I have not put on too much data stuff. First things first, uh, I would like to uh, say the plan would be to give you some background information, talk about cardiovascular injury clinical presentation, um, define some treatment and some prognostic uh, sort of indicators, uh, and I'd be grateful if people would either wait till the end for questions or if you feel that there is need for you to ask questions, by all means, feel free to stop me and ask questions as such. Um, I just need to exit for a second to try and see if I can um, just correct this because I am uh, not able to um, see some of my slides. Give me two seconds, please. Um, Right. Uh, can I then 
chat. Give me two seconds, please. Is that better? Yes, yeah, so I can now see it better. Okay. So I'm just going to talk very briefly on the renal angiotensin and aldosterone system. Um, and just to recap on what we've got thus far, it's important as, uh, you know, the, uh, the it, it, it looks like the mechanism by which uh, the COVID seems to be affecting the various organs is primarily through its interaction with one of the components of this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So towards the left of the slide, we can see where the angiotensinogen is coming from the liver. As it travels, the first ACE, a angiotensin converting enzyme uh, secreted from the lungs, affects, converts that angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 1 is obviously derived from angiotensinogen by the action of renin, which is coming from the kidneys. So you're getting the feel for this whole pathway being controlled by a number of organs and a number of processes. Once the angiotensin II is formed, it has a number of positive impacts uh, on, on uh, different places, sympathetic activity, tubular absorption of electrolytes and fluid onto the adrenal cortex for further aldosterone secretion on blood vessels, on the pituitary gland, so on and so forth. And towards the right of the slide, you can see the impact of these uh, effects of angiotensin II on the various organs. At the end of the day, on the very right-hand side, when the water and salt uh, retention takes place, there is effective circulating volume is increased and the perfusion of the uh, capillaries uh, and the glomeruli in the kidneys is impacted. And then you see a negative feedback over to the renin to say, actually, let's just reduce the angi angiotensin one production because we have enough. And this is your normal mechanism that works through. The COVID seems to be hitting the organs where this mechanism impacts. The way it is doing that is by sharing its contact point with the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which sits on the surface of the cells in various organs. When it does that, it is internalized into the cell. And once it gets into the cell, as Dr. Ahmed very elegantly described earlier on in his pictures, the virus seems to then disintegrate and start replicating and destroying the cell and moving on from cell to cell to cell. When COVID hit us and there was a suggestion that if people were using things like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocker inhibitors, the number of ACE2 receptors on cells was increased because we were blocking the angiotensin 2, which would normally interact with the ACE2 receptor. So by blocking the angiotensin 2 or reducing the production of angiotensin 2, there were more receptors on the surface and therefore the suggestion or speculation was that this would in increase the likelihood of virus attaching to the cell and then being internalized. And therefore there was all this panic about stop ACE inhibitors and ARBs and so on and so forth. This was also compounded by the fact that the retrospective CK series data from China in particular suggested that in those patients who had a poor outcome, there was a higher prevalence of hypertension. And those two factors were suggesting that if you are hypertensive and you have an ACE inhibitor, you are more likely to die because of this COVID infection. In fact, the meta-analysis of a lot of data coming through from, from not only from China, but also from America and from Italy is suggestive that the negative impact is actually not clinically relevant. And in some people, the treatment with angiotensin receptor blockers is actually protective. Now that has to be proven in randomized control studies, but there is a signal that we are seeing there. So the panic about stopping medications and uh, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs is over, and we should just be very clear that there is not a negative impact at all. 
So just recapping uh, a little bit more in a text format for what uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed has already said, this is, it's a beta coronavirus identified initially uh, in early December, 2019 um, in Wuhan in China. It's a large RNA virus and it's similar to the SARS viruses of 2003. There is roughly speaking about 25 to 50% of people may be completely asymptomatic. However, they remain infections and uh, sorry, they remain infectious and able to transmit. And the viral shedding process in sort of observational data ranges from between eight days and up to about 34 days. Um, I've talked about the interaction with the ACE2 receptors and the ACE2 receptors are present not only in the main organs, but also in the upper airway and oropharynx, which is where uh, the internalization happens and, and, and the symptoms start from. Uh, and then the next couple of points I've already mentioned in terms of its interaction with angiotensin 2 um, and, and what it does with angiotensin 2, if you remember angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, increased aldosterone and a retention of salt and water and so on and so forth. The ACE2 breaks down the angiotensin 2 into uh, vasoprotective, i.e. vasodilator uh, type, type actions. And therefore, if you don't have angiotensin 2, you have more of ACE2 floating around. Um, and so on and so forth. And I've addressed the last point uh, in my previous uh, slide. So the clinical presentations, uh, and, and I, I, again, uh, we've already, Saeed has said this, and I'm saying this again, I think there's a, there's a shortage of randomized control trial data, which is not surprising. We are only about four or five months into the pandemic and, and we're still collecting the information. A lot of it is now retrospective, audit stuff and case series and so on and so forth. So just bear with us. I refer to two particular papers. One is the COVID-19 and cardiovascular system, which was published online in cardiovascular research uh, about four weeks ago. And the other one is a uh, 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 registry data, which looked at nearly 17 million adults, uh, adult NHS patients and published by Ben Goldacre. Ben Goldacre, ben Goldacre used to work in Sheffield and he's now working down in London. Um, and and he's, he's got a very, very good track record of uh, um, looking at uh, uh, retrospective audit data and, and, and identifying cardiovascular risks and so on and so forth. And he's very well published and respected. Um, so he's looked at the 17 million uh, um, NHS adult patient data and come out with about 7,000, roughly about 7,000 deaths attributed to COVID. And this paper was published online um, uh, uh, a few days ago. Um, so it talks about the virus being transmitted by aerosol, uh, coughing, sneezing, and invasing, uh, invasive aerosol generating procedures. Incubation period ranging between one to 14 days, maybe up to 24 days, and a mean symptom emergence is around six days. Uh, the highest risk of cardiovascular impact happens about 15 to 20 days down the road, and possibly linked to the concept of cytokine surge that Saeed was talking about. And, and I'll explain that in, in, in a slightly different way, in that we understand that there are two mechanisms by which the virus attacks one is by infiltration into the cells and destroying them, and that is termed as the cytokine or cytopathic uh, sort of um, uh, impact. And the other one is uh, essentially a delayed and a possible indirect impact, which is through neurohormonal modulation, and that is a delayed sort of uh, impact. And therefore, you have two, possibly three different uh, clinical presentations, one being the um, immediate sort of a presentation of decompensated patients with perhaps heart failure, ARDS, AKI, and so on and so forth. And you wonder whether they've had the illness for a longer period of time, and then they present as a cytokine surge up front. Or you have people with the classical symptoms of cough, fever, myalgia, loss of taste, and so on and so forth, and they come in, and then six or seven days later, then deteriorate and have the typical cytokine surge while they're in hospital. Uh, the disease severity and out outcomes are primarily dependent on host characteristics, so the immunity of the patient and any other demographic data that might uh, impact, particularly pre-existing diseases and so on and so forth. Uh, 
And from all the data that we are looking at, whether they're published in uh, mainland Europe, from UK, from US or from China, the suggestion are that men who are over the age of 63 uh, to 65 uh, with a background of diabetes um, from black Asian minority, minority ethnic background, elevated BMI, pre-existing cancer, particularly hematological cancers, having renal respiratory and cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, they, they tend to do uh, much less well than individuals who are either younger or do not have these uh, predisposing factors. Um, I've deliberately left out hypertension from there because the data around hypertension is confounded by other, other factors in, in, in the studies, although hypertension in itself seems to be recognized as a risk um, for having a poorer outcome. Now, I know that Saeed did mention that there is a predisposition towards getting infection in certain groups. Uh, from, the, from the data that I've looked at, I cannot see any publication which tells us whether having cardiovascular disease, and, and it's a very broad term, people with coronary artery disease, people with arrhythmia, people with heart failure, uh, and so on and so forth, or valvular heart disease for that matter, people who have had bypass before or stents before without left ventricular dysfunction, all the whole spectrum of this cardiovascular disease. I could not see where it says that these people or these patients are or I could not see where one could identify a mechanism why how these patients were actually acquiring the illness. But what is very clear is that if you've got that background and you get a COVID, no matter where that source is, whether you get it at work, whether you get it out in the shopping center or whatever, um, that the outcome in these patients is much, much, much worse than it is in patients who do not have these predisposing factors. Um, the clinical presentation, uh, again, very briefly referring to uh, upper respiratory type symptoms, cough, sore throat, and breathlessness. Abdominal symptoms were increasingly recognized earlier on. They're, in our experience, not as common now, but certainly the earlier uh, cohort of patients that we saw maybe about eight or 10 weeks ago in our in rapid assessment units or respiratory assessment unit, there was a lot of patients presenting with abdominal symptoms, diarrhea, and so on and so forth. Uh, and obviously the loss of taste and the anosmia and stuff has been included in the list of recognizable symptoms now by the Department of Health as well. In floridly viremic patients, patients can present with shock, um, and which is no different from what you would otherwise see in cardiogenic or septic shock. Um, Saeed has touched in much more detail uh, on, on all the other inflammatory markers that we, that we should be looking at, like uh, leukocytosis. Now, that's not universal. We've had people with either minimal elevation in white cell count or even normal white cell count, but with lymphopenia, which seems to be a very recognizable and reliable marker, elevated CRP uh, downstream from interleukin-6, abnormal chest x-ray. Abnormal chest x-ray is present in our experience somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of the time um, with features that mainly suggest diffuse bilateral patchy infiltrates. Um, it tends to be less like uh, consolidation. It tends to be fairly diffuse, ill-defined uh, patchy infiltration um, and it tends to be bilateral. Um, and that's present in about 60% of the cases. In the world audit lit literature, I'm seeing somewhere around 50 to 55% um, prevalence. A hypoxia is clearly a, a bad sign and a marker for uh, poor outcomes in the longer term. And, uh, therefore, and, and the need for high uh, flow oxygen requirement is an indicator of a poor prognosis as well. Now, uh, Saeed mentioned earlier on, and I think because it's my particular area of interest, I'll talk about troponin. Um, the evidence around troponin is that roughly around 25% of patients um, will have a troponin release. Um, we have, in, in, in the last several years, learned to recognize troponin as a fairly reliable marker of myocardial injury in the context of acute coronary syndromes. And depending on where you work and what system you have, 
um, at the front door of the hospital, whether that is a cardiology admission unit or whether it is the emergency department, uh, there is this uh, uh, prevalent clinical behavior which says, if the troponin is elevate, call, elevated, call the cardiologist because this is an acute coronary syndrome. Now, I think we need to perhaps rewind on that a little bit and change our mindset. The presence of troponin elevation in this context, in the COVID context, is re really no different from um, CRP or lymphopenia and so on and so forth. And it should be dealt with in that, in that context, but as an additional marker for poorer outcome. And there are data now suggesting that if you have an elevated troponin at presentation, and you do serial measurements to show increasing uh, troponin, then that is a reliable marker for the individual requiring intensive care management or a poor outcome in general. The BNP, exactly the same. They behave like um, acute phase reactants in any inflammatory process, as does the uh, XDPD dimer uh, sort of access, which is reflecting generalized out of control um, neurohormonal activation and, and inflammatory processes, um, which uh, essentially is, a, is the biochemical way of shouting and saying, we are in trouble, do something, do some assessment and, 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 um, and intervene to, to, to stop this process. Exactly what we do, um, we are learning. Um, as Saeed referred to, and I, we've also practiced this, that we are now treating the end results of these tests, i.e. if the D-dimer is up and um, depending on how high it is, we change the weight adjusted dose of low molecular weight heparin administration or, and, and consider formal anticoagulation and so on and so forth. In the early stages of, um, um, of the disease or the pandemic presentation to hospitals, a lot of these patients landed up having uh, lots of CTs, lots of contrast and so on and so forth. Um, the, experience tells us that you would still, because the coagulopathy is present in the background, and you would still be anticoagulating them, even if they didn't show clear evidence of uh, clot in the lungs, you don't necessarily have to rush in to do a lot of contrast delivery and a lot of radiation exposure. If your clinical um, acumen tells you that you need to anticoagulate somebody, now, if they don't respond and they're hemodynamically compromised, then to confirm the size of the PE, it would make sense to go for a CT scan at that stage. But for smaller and less hemodynamically um, compromising situations, we would anticoagulate, but not necessarily chase a CT scan uh, as such. The cardiovascular presentations are phenomenal in the sense that um, you know they are... Uh, very much like what, what, what you would normally see in any acute cardiac presentation. They come, you know, arrhythmias are common, most commonly atrial fibrillation. There are cardiac arrests. We are seeing out of hospital cardiac arrests. We are seeing sudden cardiac death. We are also seeing ECG changes that are consistent with our typical presentations of acute coronary syndrome. We are seeing ST elevation. We are seeing ST segment, dy dynamic ST segments, depressions, T wave emergence, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these patients who then either present with ST elevation infarction or are presenting with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are being taken to the cath lab where we are also finding that there is a slightly higher prevalence of um, infarction in the context of normal coronary arteries um, as well as type 2 myocardial infarction rather than a proper true acute occlusive ischemic coronary event. And the treatments for these are based on what the anatomy is. There are, there's a significant number of uh, these patients who do have the COVID, who then present to the primary uh, cardiovascular presentation, go to the lab and have the, the, the box standard angioplasty and intervention carried out. Uh, we are seeing patients with heart failure, either acute or insidious, i.e. primary presentation with myocarditis up front with heart failure or heart failure secondary to an acute coronary event that has happened that has precipitated admission. There is obviously the, the, the linked sort of vascular uh, problems of peripheral thrombosis and stroke presentations. Um, what is difficult to separate is these acute events happening in people who are already known to have vascular disease 
either diagnosed or, 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 or uh, de novo presentation in people who had undiagnosed disease. And that, those are the difficult subgroups to identify, but the presentations, clinical presentations, the management is no different from what it has been always. Uh, the presumed mechanisms, uh, there is, we, I referred to this earlier on, there is a direct cell damage by viral infiltration or endocytosis, and, and that destroys the cell and then moves from cell to cell to cell, um, causing destruction in the, in the, in the uh, organs, uh, reflected by increased capillary permeability. Uh, you get the ARDS type presentation with uh, lungs that are full of fluid. You can get that by peripheral vessels being destroyed and third spacing of, of fluid and, and pre presenting classically with that, with the combination that we heard of recently, which or, or just a few minutes ago with, with a volume, intravascular volume depleted, but fluid overloaded patient, which you know, is extremely difficult to, to, to control. You then get the micro and macrovascular dysfunction. You have the immune system disruption and then a later surge because the immune system uh, circulates all the hormones that cause a negative feedback on various cardiac function leading to a multi-organ failure situation. And clearly these are then multiplied by pre-existing disease. So if you've already got physiological compromise situation with poor physiological cardiac reserve, then any over, you know, any acute deterioration or an impact is going to make uh, the uh, clinical picture much worse and survival less likely. Um, age and overall vulnerability being, being uh, two important um, sort of mechanisms. So looking at the, the third paper, which I looked at is Liu and uh, their colleagues, uh, you know, published in Circulation, uh, American Heart Association recently looked at the uh, under, science underlying COVID-19 pandemic um, in the context of either pre-existing or de novo cardiovascular disease. And the suggestion was that if you had no pre-existing condition, so you're looking at the, the very um, uh, last line on the slide, but no pre-existing condition, your actual mortality rate in, in that context is, is, is pretty much what you would get with a fairly severe flu in, um, sort of um, uh, infection. However, as you go up on the slide, the pre-existing cardiovascular disease then makes your mortality tremendously high probability and in the order of about multiplication by a factor of 10. The pre-existing cancers, you know, we, we know that people with malignancy, uh, whether treated or not, have a poor uh, or an altered immune mechanism and therefore they are prone to co you know, concomitant illnesses and infections and they do poorly. The chronic respiratory disease is not a surprise. Diabetes is not a surprise. Hypertension mortality rate. So th this is what I was referring to earlier on. The suggestion in the earlier paper was that people with hypertension ha were, were, were dying more from COVID disease. But the argument was that the people who succumbed to um, the COVID-19 infection uh, were actually in the age group where hypertension is prevalent. So whether the link with hypertension is just a function of prevalent disease in a vulnerable population or whether hypertension is a causative or a cause and effect relationship remains to be identified, but it is now noted to be one of the pre-existing conditions that makes your survival less likely if it is, it is there and, and people get um, um, the infection. Um, from the outcomes perspective, we have heart failure, myeloid pericarditis, uh, vasculitis, infarction, as I explained, full spectrum of it, arrhythmias and thrombotic events. Roughly about 25% have elevated troponin, and that re does reflect myocardial injury. The question is whether the myocardial injury is a primary ischemic event or is a secondary event due to the fulminant infection and so on and so forth, and uh, you know, type 1 or type 2 differentiation. Uh, but it, is, it seems to be a reliable marker for a poorer outcome in the longer term. Um, it also, there is some suggestion from a paper um, that I read about two days ago. Um, they, there is a suggestion that serial elevation of troponin is a reliable indicator for the need for ICCU. Uh, 
um, transfer as well because they're just telling you the myocardium is not coping. Uh, BNP has a similar profile to troponin and these combinations uh, of, of features that are commonly and easily measured in any medical ward um, should raise concerns around the expected outcome for that individual and should be ringing alarm bells to put supportive um, and symptomatic treatments in place as quickly as possible. So I'm just going to, with that background, I'm just going to very quickly talk about the heart failure in COVID patients. It is no different from the box standard heart failure. This is the standard definition of heart failure, which suggests that the cardiac structure and organ, or organ as such is unable to maintain an output which is in keeping with the demands of the body, irrespective of whether the cause of this inability is primary cardiac or not, which basically means that the organ can be damaged itself and therefore not function, or it can be overwhelmed by a systemic illness, which then uh, reduces its capacity to work. And the acute circulatory failure versus insidious symptom development perhaps seem to be two different mechanisms or, or clinical pathways by which it presents. Now, these are the very well-known causes of uh, heart failure, i.e. you have less fluid or the pump is failing. And the various causes of either fluid loss or pump failure, and in the context of COVID, these are obviously the recognized mechanisms by which you might find both the pathways active. Severe septicemia, severe viremia, vasodilatation essentially gets you a relative uh, low fluid status. And then the fever, the vomiting, diarrhea, and the sort of stuff makes you lose fluid. So you get hypovolemic. And then clearly the uh, impact on myocardium leads to pump failure, whether it is in the context of damage to the heart muscle itself or in the context of altered function because of persistent, resistant, or new arrhythmia. Um, as we all know, 25% uh, of the cardiac output is from atrial contrib contribution to ventricular filling. So a new at atrial fibrillation in somebody who is septic with vasodilatation hypovolemia, you can imagine the impact that will have on cardiac output and um, what it does to the symptom status and the clinical uh, parameters that we measure. The mechanism, again, is no different from what we already know about. The fall in cardiac output, whether it is volume loss or pump failure, uh, activates the neurohormonal systems. And we've gone through what the renal angiotensin system does to that. And then obviously there is a central sympathomimetic impact which causes increase in heart rate and vasoconstriction that contributes to try and preserve as much perfusion to vital organs as we possibly can. And that leads to the symptoms and, and the signs that we perceive on clinical assessment. Uh, the suggestion is that somewhere around uh, one fifth of the patients presenting with COVID will sustain a myocardial injury of some description. Um, whether it is direct infiltration of the virus into the myocardium or whether it is a neurohormonal um, immune mediated impact on the myocardial function um, is, I think, is academic. There is some uh, data from the European endomyocardial biopsy stuff, which is suggesting that the virus material is present in up to about 80% of patients um, who are, so th these, these are obviously autopsy studies. The, there are very few centers who will be brave enough to take on doing endomyocardial biopsy in live patients in the current climate. Um, so these are uh, post-mortem studies that, we, that, that, that I'm referring to. Um, and therefore by that, token perhaps more selective as well, and then selection bias will, will, will impact on this because these are people who have died of myocardial injury, and therefore you expect that there'll be a greater prevalence. So whether this translates into, uh, how this translates into general population of COVID positive, asymptomatic, COVID positive, non-cardiac patients, I don't know at this point. Um, but what we are sure of is that whatever the mechanism of myocardial injury is, as soon as the clinical manifestation of myocardial injury comes in, there is clear uh, sort of indication that the outcome is gonna be poor and roughly about um, half of these patients, um, half of the patients who died, died due to a cardiorespiratory collapse disorder. So management depends 
basically, uh, you know, uh, on, on how we treat symptoms and how we can support patients and hope that we can alter the course of this illness. Um, the very few RCT data, um, uh, I think uh, I'm privileged to have access to some of the uh, viral stuff that is coming out of Oxford and uh, Cambridge. And day before yesterday, Remdesivir is uh, the study they were looking at uh, hasn't been reported and is in publication suggesting that uh, remdesivir shortens the duration of illness from 15 days to 11 days in symptomatic patients. Um, does that mean that they have less uh, mortality? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, the numbers are relatively small and the data is still being looked at. Uh, so the headline data is that the duration of illness is shortened. People feel better earlier using remdesivir. Uh, we are still waiting for the details on, on other data being collected as part of that. Um, there's, as Said said, and, I, and we all know, large number of RCTs are ongoing with antivirals, antimalarials, um, immunomodulating agents, including steroids. A bit of caution around the antimalarials. Um, there is obviously anecdotal data suggesting that uh, these are helpful, but we as cardiologists uh, should be very clear when we talk to patients, and, and I believe you me, there are patients who ask, ask these questions on a regular basis, um, is that the risk of having things like torsadipoin, ventricular fibrillation, other malignant arrhythmias in the context of patients having um, anti-malarials, but without knowing what their predisposition towards these malignant arrhythmias is, we just need to be very cautious in how we accept and, um, and, and allow use of these medications. Um, there is some suggestion that ACE inhibitors and ARBs may be protective. Um, whether this is to do with the behavior of ACE2, which changes when ARBs are present, i.e. the ACE2 as a feedback mechanism gets down-regulated, or it's still present in high numbers in the cell surface, but its behavior changes because the ARBs are also modulating it. That is speculative, but there is some signal to suggest that the use of ARB as inhibitors might in fact be protective. So the treatment basically depends on, this is divided into three uh, groups, symptomatic, supportive, and prognostic. The symptomatic treatments are pretty straightforward. You deal with the oxygen requirements, whichever way you want to, NIV or um, non-invasive ventilation, ventilation. Um, you know, we, we've been historically in the card context of cardiovascular presentation management being used to using morphine and dimorphine to, um, people, to, for people with acute pulmonary edema and breathlessness and hypoxia and type one respiratory failure. We just need to be conscious that the mechanism of hypoxia in COVID patients is different from pure acute pulmonary edema. So just be aware of that. The symptomatic treatment with pain relief, paracetamol, et cetera, et cetera, diuretics. Changes may be ARDS. You just need to be clear. We do not want to have people dehydrated over and above their third spacing, which gives us that problem about intravascular dehydration and um, uh, extravascular fluid load. So just be aware of that. People have used nitrates. I've used nitrates in the context of COVID, but I've always made sure that we get an echo done before so I understand what the filling pressures are. And just to add on a little bit to what Sid said earlier on, is that there is another very easy mechanism of understanding what the fluid status is by looking at the right ventricle filling on an echocardiogram. And the patterns will tell you, and we can measure um, indirect measurement of uh, wedge pressures and so on and so forth. So just be, just be aware that that can be done. Uh, for those of, uh, of us who have an interest in echo as well, um, there are pretty reliable data on good um, sort of uh, uh, echo being able to provide very, very good um, measurement of hemodynamics within the cardiopulmonary uh, physiology uh, rather than having to depend on invasive uh, sort of procedures. And beta blockers. I mentioned beta blocker as a supportive treatment for heart rate control, for um, uh, atrial fibrillation ventricular rate control, and for uh, control of, say, you know, ischemia or angina or, 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 or heart failure. And there is pretty good evidence 
for the use of beta blockers in acute heart failure now as well. So just be aware that that is an option available, obviously with monitored um, surroundings. Um, we need to, well, uh, I don't want to be in direct conflict with Saeed, but uh, I, I do wish to say that if there is somebody who is in florid pulmonary edema and your echo is telling you that the ventricle is knackered because uh, left ventricle is dilated and so on and so forth, um, and, and therefore I suggest that the threshold for echo should be very low, then avoid fluids, uh, IV fluids in that context if you can. Um, um, prone positioning with or without ventilation, Saeed has talked about it. We are obviously seeing in some patients this being used and to used to good um, sort of benefit. Um, uh, chest physiotherapy is something that one can take. Uh, obviously, the monitoring of all the physiological parameters that allows you to measure what the response to your intervention is. Um, measuring things like BNPs, troponin, CRP on a serial basis and early echo. echo and repeat echo later on because as you as i mentioned earlier on there is that initial impact and there might be a delayed neurohormonal impact with the cytokine surge which basically um, can be picked up with echocardiography if the cardiac function coming in was good and going um, and, and when the patient deteriorates the lv dysfunction is, is poor then it tells you what the prognosis is going to be uh, if the cardiomyopathy is confirmed you know, Saeed has spoken about the um, renal replacement therapy. ECMO is an option. Um, I'm not a great fan of inotropes and sympathetic stimulants, uh, although in the short term, you know, most ICCUs will use um, adrenaline, noradrenaline um, on a, uh, you know, on a very, very frequent basis to support. Um, I would urge a little bit of caution with these drugs because clearly if you've got somebody, and, and this is the experience, um, on our normal clinical presentations of heart failure as well is that if you've already got a struggling heart, then driving the heart rate or the force of contraction can sometimes have a detrimental effect. So just be cautious uh, using things like inotropes and uh, synthetic stimulants. Um, I question the role of uh, left ventricular assist devices. Um, we're not into the life cycle of this illness long enough for, to under, uh, for us to understand whether um, a, LVAD is feasible, um, and two, whether it is going to be beneficial. But I'm absolutely sure that there will be people looking at things like um, balloon pumps of, of, of different types in ICCU settings to see if they can help with the cardiac um, uh, flow and cardiac output to have an impact on the outcomes. Um, I've mentioned the remdesivir, um, and these are basically the prognostic interventions. Um, there is invasive ventilatory support. Um, but we know that while we are assessing people up front, uh, measuring their parameters, and then referring to ICCU where they're being supported, the very fact that they are going to ICCU and require respiratory support in itself is a negative prognostic indicator, and the survival seems to be poor. Um, proning seems to have a, a positive impact on some subgroups, but not all. Um, um, I've mentioned ARBs and, and the role there. Um, managing arrhythmias, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, as you would in normal circumstances, is very, very important because you don't want to be missing out on um, managing a reversible cause, which just happens to happen to somebody who is affected by COVID-19. And I think we need to be cautious around how we uh, prognosticate when patients are coming into hospital with COVID-19. Uh, just because somebody has COVID-19 and might have comorbidities doesn't mean that the treatments should be either limited, restricted, or withdrawn without um, a, a proper thought being given to what would make a difference to their outcome or what would change um, the overall picture to allow patients to recover. And, and my concern is that because we are seeing floridly viremic patients coming in with hemodynamic compromise that we, based on a short time of collection of data of five or six months in, this, in, in the pandemic, we're making decisions up front around do not resuscitate and so on and so forth. I don't think they're necessarily wrong decisions or incorrect decisions. And I think it is important we do assess the need for these, but I would urge a word of caution to say, make sure you've looked at all the reversible sort of options before saying, uh, we can't do much for, for, for any individual. Of course, there are patients who are, you know, 
young 35, 40 year olds who have no comorbidities and who are very, very poorly and we don't talk about do not resuscitate there. Then there are other people who are in their mid to late 90s and they're coming in with high comorbidity and we know that the gain uh, in terms of life prolongation and stuff like that is extremely limited. So there are those two extremes that you can perhaps very sensibly say, yeah, I'm, I am or I'm not going to talk about resuscitation here, but there is a big broad group in the middle where careful consideration needs to be given to what is the right decision. Um, the aggressive monitoring and management of coagulopathy is critical. You, you can treat coronary artery disease, you can treat heart failure, you can treat respiratory problems, and get them out to the ward and then their coagulopathy kills them because they've had either a massive stroke or, or a massive pulmonary embolism. So just be aware and upfront with monitoring and treating the coagulopathy uh, and that's critical to survival, I, in my opinion. So in conclusion, what I would say is uh, it's a highly infectious person-to-person -person transmission. More patients have, a, you know, most patients have a mild or asymptomatic clinical course. 16%, roughly 16-70% have a severe illness with a significantly variable reported mortality rates ranging from 1.6 to about 12%. Um, I think these are unreliable. I think we are unreliable because no one in the world has taken at the moment, uh, or sorry, no one in the world at the moment has published fully reliable data on what the background prevalence of COVID-19 is in the population, including the incidental positives, asymptomatic positives, symptomatic positives, survivors, and dead positive patients. And therefore, we have no understanding what the denominator is. What we're looking at is snapshots of people who are coming into hospital, and most people come into hospital because they're symptomatic. So you're looking at a percentage of the overall COVID uh, positive patients in, in, in the world. So just be careful how the prevalence data and mortality data is interpreted in that context. We had, if you remember, when the when the, the pandemic was announced by WHO, the suggestion was that the mortality rates were going to be similar to flu, i.e. less than 1 to 1.5 percent overall. And that was based on some modeling work that suggested that if there was a prevalence, um, a certain level of prevalence in the population, it would do two things. One, it would uh, perhaps induce an immunity, which is the so-called herd immunity type uh, uh, sort of concept, and like the flu viruses do, and also it would allow you to have a larger population of positive patients, but a very small percentage of people with bad outcomes, i.e. an acceptable level of mortality, et cetera, et cetera. So just be aware of how this data is interpreted because we don't know what that denominator is. There are, however, very easily identified pre-existing clinical diagnoses, and main, most of these are cardiorespiratory. I'm deliberately not talking about the people with, say, um, hematology, uh, hematology cancers or already established on um, dialysis and so on and so forth, because they are extremely high-risk group and vulnerable group because their immune, immune systems are already modulated and modified. But in the cardiorespiratory context, Things like uh, you know, long-standing respiratory illnesses, coronary artery disease, arrhythmias, heart failure, and so on and so forth are easily recognizable clinical diagnoses that tell you that people with, uh, in, with these conditions, if they get COVID-19, will do poorly in the wrong, longer term, and we need to identify them upfront and protect them as much as possible. Um, and I'm coming to the last slide. So symptomatic and supportive treatment should be instituted early. Close monitoring of biochemical, hemodynamic, and respiratory parameters is absolutely critical. Uh, need for invasive ventilation seems to be a strong indicator of a poor outcome. So, I, so my practice has changed in the sense that when in, in the normal circumstances in COVID negative heart failure or acute myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest patients, I am keen to get them the ventilation support because I know that all they need is a period of rest, physiological rest, from normal working and then they will make a recovery. If I do this early, there's a better chance for them to, to improve. Um, in COVID type circumstances, I know that we're getting to the stage of uh, invasive ventilation. There is something that that patient's physiology is telling us that they, it, it doesn't like uh, and, and is, uh, is unlikely to do well in the longer term. Um, for these vulnerable patients in, in whom we know that there is pre-existing condition and so on and so forth, shielding or isolation is probably sensible to consider.
And obviously, we, we wait for the RCT outcome in the longer term and hope that we will be able to uh, get some um, reliable um, prognostic indicators that we can modify and we will have treatment that will impact on the outcome, hopefully in the longer term. Uh, we'll, so watch this space. Thank you very much. I am, that's me done. I hope it's been helpful. Um, I'm open to questions if people wish to ask any. I'm gonna exit this. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Janejo. That was a fantastic talk.